Uh, do you want me to start? I could start if you want. Okay. Or it's up to you. Well, I'll introduce you. Uh, for okay. Those of you. <laughs> uh, welcome, fine. everyone, to a, a, another ACO this a beautiful Saturday morning. Uh, I'm happy to, I, I guess, reintroduce Melissa, who will be introducing Anthony. Uh, but if you haven't had a chance to see Melissa's talk uh, about mid-April, uh, go check out that that um, that posting, that video. It was a fabulous talk. So we're very lucky that uh, she was able to join us uh, last month. Uh, this month, she's actually hosting uh, one of our artists, Anthony Servino, who uh, she will be uh, introducing right now. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Jordan. It's great to be back. Thank you, Mariana. So just to remind everybody where we are, uh, this is Art Clinic Online. It's run by J. Jordan Bruns and Mariana Kastriakis. Uh, the goal of ACO is to promote artists in and around the DMV area through Zoom discussions like this that are later archived on YouTube. So these discussions are free to the public. Uh, they're supported in part by Maryland State Arts Council. So you can always go back and look at this uh, talk, among others, uh, later on YouTube. So I am really, really, really thrilled uh, to have Anthony Servino with us today. Uh, he's an esteemed arts educator with a 25 year career in professional exhibition, including many shows and presentations at galleries in and around DC. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of an academic description of Anthony. He's a native of Pennsylvania. Uh, Servino studied art at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and Towson University. Currently, Anthony teaches sculpture at Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and he co-directs Ejecta Projects, which is an independent art gallery and curatorial workshop located in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, that he runs alongside his wife, Shannon Egan. Um, so Anthony's artwork explores a wide range of themes, including youthful innocence, male virility, fatherhood, and vulnerability. Once described as archaeological relics of boyhood narratives, I love that, uh, Servino's artwork evokes bittersweet associations, seamlessly blending reflections on youth with the realities of adulthood. Ultimately, Servino's sculptures serve as poignant celebrations of everyday objects that pay homage to the emotional resonance and hidden histories embedded within both familiar and unfamiliar items. So uh, I met Anthony at the Corcoran College of Art and Design when I was actually a student there. He was a professor of mine in sculpture. He was also the head of exhibition design uh, for the Corcoran College. So we had an opportunity to work together on exhibitions. So I have a firsthand appreciation for uh, Anthony's elegant way of speaking about art, uh, the way he can find depth in seemingly simple things, um, sort of seeing the monumental and seemingly small, uh, modest things and ideas. So with that, uh, I'm very, very excited. I hardly covered uh, his craftsmanship, which is its own beautiful uh, aspect of his artwork and practice. So with that, uh, I'm very excited to be presenting Anthony Servino, where uh, it's a joy to hear you speak about your work. And with that, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you for being here. Wow. Okay. Thank you so much, Melissa. And uh, obviously, thank you to to Jordan and Mariana for and the Art Clinic Online uh, for the invitation to present my work. Also to the Maryland State Arts Council for their support of the ACO. And uh, to all of you who have turned up on this gorgeous day, I, we, we were surveying and it sounds like it's really beautiful everywhere today, which is lovely to start the three-day weekend. So thank you all for turning up today. I'm going to screen share right now. We're going to just hop right into it a little bit. So I do appreciate the, the, the more or less uh, the, the kind of uh, academic um, uh, uh, introduction. I, I did want to add, although uh, I, my undergraduate degree was from uh, University of North Carolina in sculpture, I started at Penn State, which isn't too far up the road from me, where I studied poultry science chickens for about three years before I failed out because I was hanging out at the art building too much. So um, I always like to add that on. I, I feel a little bit like I've always been a prisoner of academ academia rather than uh, someone drawn to it naturally. It's a, it's a very strange relationship, but I've been teaching at Dickinson for 16 years, 17 years now, and uh, very happy in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. So um, I'm going to start 
hopping in with a quote. Uh, you guys probably know Jerry Saltz. He's a social media celebrity and art critic for the New York Magazine. Uh, his quote here, I think, rings really true for me, and I, I know it's not true for everyone, for sure. I, I rarely think I'm the best person to talk about my work. Um, uh, I know some folks feel like they have that that ownership. I'm very suspicious of how I understand my own work. So I'm going to do something a little different with this talk today. I'm uh, I'm going to try something new, which is to start off by showing you six or seven works um, that that basically I've already written about, and I'm going to read some of my writing to you about those works. I think sometimes the writing is very direct; other times it's sort of uh, oblique. Um, even so, this should give you a better sense of maybe what my studio practice looks like and where I'm coming from sort of uh, conceptually and sometimes uh, in terms of my materiality choices and, and things like that. And so I'm gonna hop right into the first one. So uh, this is a small self portrait titled Stitchless. Uh, I recarved this wooden souvenir sailor back in 2020. Uh, recently, I chose this modest work to be the centerpiece of a survey exhibition I mounted at Shippensburg University. That show featured 34 sculptures selected from the past 25 years, and the title of that show was also Stitchless. I love the implication of without a stitch, sort of as in the nude or otherwise existing in a vulnerable state. So much of my work questions notions of vulnerability. That vulnerability sometimes shows up in relationship to explorations of identity and memory. Sometimes it manifests as outcomes of uneven power dynamics. And sometimes it resides in kind of acceptance of unknowing, especially in some of the sculptures I've made that investigate um, both uh, missing information and misinformation. Additionally, in thinking more literally about stitches and how they attach things, and I'm thinking skin and fabric, the word stitchless suggests without connection, which is a gentle nod to uh, my more or less intuitive studio practice. One might also think about stitches with respect to wound treatment. Uh, we get stitches in part to minimize scarring. In a psychological sense, some of my work investigates emotional trauma and a desire to explore the events that made those uh, particular scars. I think to um, maybe tongue in cheek, the title of the self-portrait, uh, as well as that survey exhibition, recalls Hans Christian Andersen's folktale, The Emperor's New Clothes, and that uncomfortable mix of unashamed confidence and either personal gullibility or just plain self-delusion that sometimes is required to make and exhibit art. And I think some of us probably, those of us who are makers, you face this with every time you, you hang something on a wall or put it on a pedestal out for the public, you know, uh, you have to almost, uh, fool yourself into thinking it's as important as it is, but without that, it, it doesn't necessarily uh, ever leave the studio. So that's the first one. Sculpture number two, shown here installed at the Arlington Art Center in 2016 as part of an exhibition titled uh, King of the Forest Adventures in Bioperversity, Pervert, Perversity. Uh, Button Eye Bear is a painted bronze sculpture that was cast from a beat up kitschy candle that I modified with the addition of a button eye. Uh, a fable was written in conjunction with this sculpture. And you can see the fable on the wall itself in uh, vinyl. Uh, in this fable, a bear cub is born with one normal eye that sees things for what they really are and one button eye with which the bear can see all that he imagines. Ignored by his mother, he sets off into the woods and eventually meets a young girl. She immediately gives him all the attention and love he needs. She whispers kindnesses into his ear, plays with him all day, and holds him close when she sleeps. However, the bear eventually gets hungry, and in the middle of the night, he simply eats her. Too long to read aloud here, the moral lesson that closes the fable reads, If seeing is believing, then be careful where you look. A button-eyed bear can never see all the things it claims it should, as a singularly primal beast who can feed his pressing need, but has no stomach for childhood. This piece titled Mischief is deceivingly, a deceivingly simple looking book of matches. The modest little sculpture is a reference to fire making as a hallmark of human advancement, but also a, a nod to boyhood impulses to destroy things as an act of play. 
Of course, the object is also designed to reference the kind of matchbook a lowlife might pick up in a seedy bar. I wanted this tiny sculpture to speak to the grand potential of humankind, while also hinting at our perhaps greater capacity for failure and self-destruction. More practically, this matchbook is made of folded steel that I chemically treated to darken and seal the surface. The text was applied as an inkjet transfer print, and the red match heads are simply built up using multiple applications of red enamel paint. Lastly, the, most, uh, the mostly wooden display box that holds this small sculpture sports an aluminum veneer and is lined with linen and fronted with 3 16th inch plate glass. And these boxes, uh, these kind of wall mounted boxes, I've done quite a few of them and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about those here. At times, my work invites viewers to embrace a paradoxical concept of a future archaeological display in which cultural artifacts from now are given context from the imagined perspective of a forthcoming new civilization. Sometimes these imagined future curators just get it wrong. That convoluted notion of an imagined future misinterpretation is not so dissimilar from the process of reflecting on my own childhood through the critical lens of parenting two daughters. As a card carrying member of the kids on bike generation, and by that I mean I was after school out on my bike, I came home when it was dark and I got into all sorts of mischief. Um, I struggle with my own knee jerk desire to protect my children from adventure, freedom, and occasionally the associated trauma of danger or risk to which youth is magnetically attracted. On the left, made of painted cast bronze, my daughter's hair in an, in an elastic hairband, Relic from Memory, that's the title, was conceived of as a physical record of childhood, both mine and theirs, misremembered. On the right are some uh, images of At Long Last, a wall sculpture from 2018. I collect Hardy Boys books, or rather one particular Hardy Boys book, number 27, The Secret of Skull Mountain. Arranged in, long, in a long row, the overlapping book covers frame a skull, you can see it there, in the hand of one of the protagonists, Joe Hardy. Not unlike a repeating film cell, this moment from the book's narrative is frozen, never advancing, never resolved. My father started reading this book to me when I was a small boy. He never finished it, and I still, to this day, wonder how it ended. Number five, in terms of the sculptures we're looking at here. In, tw uh, let's see here, 2003, sorry about that, I made a 12 foot high painted steel toy kit panel for downtown Baltimore, titled Assembly Required. This sculpture included parts for a parking meter, a light rail sign, part of a bench, fragments from a clock tower, all of which could be seen in the immediate landscape from the site of the sculpture. I imagine that this one sculpture was somehow part of a larger kit for assembling the city and that there were literally thousands of these panels that we would need to assemble the entire city. Um, by some extension of that idea, I also knew I'd eventually need to populate the city, uh, leading to the idea of building kits for making individuals. Titled Self-Portrait Fully Assembled, this kit on the right is a six foot tall panel, uh, six foot tall painted steel self-portrait from 2007 that was measured precisely to hold my arms, my legs, my head, Perhaps my torso and abdomen are part of an imaginary second panel, or maybe they're implied within the framework of this, uh, of this kit. Uh, as the title suggests, the parts of this kit are, have already been sort of popped out uh, and glued together, uh, presumably, leaving only the empty sprue to embody me when I am not present. Transistor radios were transformative for me back when I was a kid in the 80s. It was my preferred portable music device, even over uh, Walkmans. Uh, at night, I would sleep with a transistor radio at my ear and listen to anything that was far away, including weather and traffic reports from distant cities, call-in shows about sex or politics or the paranormal, or, or I'd park the dial on a station transmitting from Canada just to feel transported, lulled to sleep, by radio announcers speaking French with an urgency and an authority that compelled the strangest dreams. I should say I don't speak French. They might have just been also recapping the weather and the traffic. Um, radio offered me comfort, 
a sense of independence and a kind of personal space that was sometimes hard to carve out as a kid in a big family living somewhat nomadically and in tight quarters. I continue to collect portable radios and I still have my original blue and white sound design transistor I got as a birthday gift in the 70s. It still works. I love the tinny sound of transistors. I love the, the clunkiness and even the taste of nine volt batteries. And the tinny or and the funky mix of colors and designs that transistor radio makers produced as they attempted to balance elegance with functionality and often on the cheap. I continue to prefer radio, even over streaming music, uh, commercials and all. I have a battery oper operated radio in my bathroom now, and I listen every morning to local stations as I shower and brush my teeth. It feels analog and alive and somehow fixes me to the here and now of every new day. In this stupidly simple sculpture titled Weak Signal, I have fabricated and painted a solid steel antenna. It's only about six inches in diameter there. Um, it looks like the kind of expanded, expandable antenna one might find on a transistor radio, but bent into a crooked spiral. Of course, spirals have deeply complex and ancient symbolic associations with growth, enlightenment, consciousness, evolution, and all sorts of related ideas. So maybe this sculpture is about all of those things, or maybe it is simply a recollection of warm memories and my continued connection to the simple desire to know how the rush hour traffic is moving in a city 500 miles away. Late last year, I was invited to make a new piece for an art and social justice initiative titled Hashtag Meaning of Home, an exhibition and interdisciplinary uh, collaborative project in Novi Sad, Serbia. This was a great opportunity for me and I, uh, I was thrilled to be invited. Uh, as a strategy for making art, the concept of home dwells within larger themes of family, architecture, nationhood, and the associated feelings of safety, isolation, and desire. So to make this work, I looked very immediately at these notions in a series of sculptures collectively titled Homemade, comprised of small scaled handcrafted tables that one might find beside a bed or an armchair. Each work refers obliquely to various functions of a house, for example, playing, bathing, sleeping, etc. The collection of objects appear at first as a patchwork of furniture, but taken together, the installation can be understood as a sculptural montage of different rooms, contexts, and identities. Um, all of which are associated with this, whatever this idea of home is. Because the implied spaces that each of these tables emanates um, seem to be both spectral and estranged from a larger dwelling or house, they are not presented in any kind of functional taxonomy. In other words, they are not isolated specimens, but rather form a more ambiguous community, a misfit family. The sculptures allude not simply to interior, interior furnishings, but to the more basic needs and desires of what constitutes a home, warmth, shelter, and belonging. And here's a few more uh, images of those. So you can see some of the tops. There's a, um, some of them were built literally from other pieces of furniture. Some of them are cobbled together. I do a lot of cannibalization in my studio. Um, and so a lot of them are older sculptures that I thought had related themes that I decided were worth sacrificing uh, to bring th whatever that energy is, whatever that gestalt is into this new work. Um, some of the, the details that are harder to capture in, uh, in images, but I think that really sort of stood out when you were encountering them in person uh, featured here. Uh, and again, uh, some more details from different tabletops. One where there's a fire ring and a fire that was on top of a, a, an end table that sort of plays with this inside outside relationship. The tub stopper on an old drink stain that kind of talks about fluidity and certainly like the bodily processes of kitchens and bathrooms and, and so, both so central to homes. And in one, uh, a, a decorative plate, a uh, little orphan Annie. Um, kind of the idea of an orphan being homeless, uh, sort of uh, ob obstructed or obliterated in some ways by the by the uh, the glass uh, that covers it, but hopefully still readable. And there they are as a collective. Sadly, it cost me a fortune to get these to Serbia, and I had to abandon them there. So I'm hoping to get over at some point to see if I can still collect them and bring them home, which is a nice way to wrap up 
that that notion of, of artwork about home. So those are the the kind of seven. And again, I know it's a little stodgier to, to read, but um, I, I do I do adore writing about work, my work, other people's work. And so uh, being able to pick through some of that writing and, and do a slightly deeper dive into some of this work will make the next section maybe make a little more sense. Um, Oh, sorry, there's the work installed in, in Serbia. Uh, here again are my studios. Uh, the, the image on the, the left is the space I'm sitting in right now. The other is the, the wood studio right outside my door. Um, again, it shows a, a bit of my chaos in my process. Um, and this is merely a placeholder image so that I can say uh, that some of the connecting impulses you'll see in the next couple of images and again it's more of a free form selection of art just off of uh, from the last 20 years or so um, some of those those connecting impulses you might see include a sincere investigation of objectness and materiality an underlying love of formalism and like how things are made at the core of the work a celebration and investigation of play in childhood which I think Melissa alluded to in her introduction um, an interest in ritual, rites of passage, and totemic beliefs that convey both kind of sentimental and cultural meaning, um, and a love of craft, uh, both in terms of material expertise and craftship, but also maybe that less academic realm of DIY crafting. I mean, I love a hot glue stick, right? It's 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 awesome. So all of that kind of is my, gives you some context for the things you'll see. So I'm just going to run through it and talk much more casually about the work as in just a, a lot of pictures, essentially. All right. Uh, on the left is a little bronze sculpture called Friendship is Magic. It's a uh, cast bronze with uh, paint and flocking. And on the right is another little bronze sculpture uh, called World's Best. And uh, World's Best, you might you might recognize those from the 70s and early 80s, a lot of the little kitschy sculptures that Hallmark stores would sell, uh, little awards that were you could give the World's Best Dad, World's Best Mom, World's Best Grandparent. Some of them had integrated ashtrays. Uh, they were made of a plastic and they had a couple of different uh, uh, sort of company or, or manufacturer names like Silly Sculpts or Impossible Sculptures, I think was one. Uh, or Paulina, Pauli, Paulina figures, I think was another. Um, they're collectible today. I, I, I do have a collection of those, um, but these were all pulled from a, a library I have of ceramic slip molds that um, from a regional campground that they used to do and sell ceramic ware. A slip mold uh, are these sort of often bulky plaster forms that you would pour a, a liquid clay into and you could pull out the form and fire it and sort of mass produce at a, at a small scale. But um, when used uh, to cast wax, you can soak them in water, pull out a wax form and use that for part of the bronze casting process. So uh, these are all composites uh, forms from multiple molds and I'm able to pull from this sort of object library and piece together bits and pieces. So uh, the unicorn and the little figure were totally separate uh, from separate molds as are multiple parts of the other of the other figure. I've done a number of these redacted sculptures uh, where I've blotted out uh, parts of found objects with blocks of wood. Uh, on the left is the redacted Betsy Ross plate. And on the right, a redacted family photograph. Again, both found objects. The redacted series, and I did a number of these. I redacted guns and crucifixes and um, medals, all sorts of things, a pair of antlers. I mean, all sorts of things I, I was able to redact. I chose these objects because they were, in many ways, uh, unredactable. You, you can only go so far. And then when I talk about redaction, I'm talking about that language that the CIA uses to block out you know, information on documents that that sort of incredibly dense, but uh, uh, um, editing of information. Um, but again, I chose these objects because I felt like even when you redacted someone like Betsy Ross, you don't necessarily lessen the impact. And with this with this matriarchal figure on the right, so much of her personality and her identity was carried in the hands in that image that. I felt like reducing her to that almost made her a stronger figure in this image. Uh, it's sort of, again, unredactable. Uh, the redactions, I think I mentioned always with sort of blocks of wood, which takes some doing to kind of, especially work around uh, complicated uh, forms. This is a, a, a kind of a, uh, 
tender little, I think, sculpture called Last Wish. Um, I mentioned, uh, we were talking before the talk, uh, I, I do travel to Norway sometimes. I've been going to a residency, an artist residency in Norway since 2011. I've been back six or seven times. Um, they don't have a lot of things for sculptors, a lot of tools or a lot of facilities. So I'm always, uh, I love being pressed into being inventive. Uh, it feels like a return to something so pure. Uh, in this case, uh, in the days leading up to the residency, I had my children uh, scour the streets of Bergen between the cobblestones to pull out um, wheel weights, lead wheel weights that have fallen off of cars, uh, which are out of fashion now. So they're, they're definitely older. You don't find those in Norway so much anymore. Um, and I was able to take this little bag of wheel weights to the residency and melt them and cast them into different forms. And this was a cast candle that was carved, uh, the negative space was carved into two blocks of wood. So it started as a carving and then became a casting and then got treated with uh, colored waxes. It's one of the few things out of the 30 or 35 sculptures I've made in Norway, it's one of the few things, again, I could afford to, to bring home in my pocket, basically. Um, napping, napping is the stone age craft of making uh, spear points, arrowheads, things along those lines where you take a rock and you hit it with another rock and then you refine the edge with a piece of bone or yet another rock. Um, love ancient technology. Here I've applied that same process to the napping, K-N-A-P-P-I-N-G, the napping of uh, ceramic ware. Uh, you'll see I use a lot of decorative plates in my work. Uh, I love the kind of cultural references and the Americana that you get in these plates, the diversity of, of sort of the American experience, everything from Star Trek to Jesus to national monuments to the love of kittens, you know, it's just all in these plates and it's so fantastic. The napping process though is not precise. So you end up, you get what you get and you, you break a lot of plates. Um, it also, you know, again, this, this return to the boyhood act of a sort of Cub Scouts that would, make arrowheads or collect arrowheads and frame them in boxes very similar to this. I love the way this sort of throws back to that, that, that kind of, uh, again, my memories of childhood and the implied both the violence and the craft and the care. I mean, it's all mixed in there at once. Another napped piece, this time's a full on ax called uh, Double Troubled. Uh, it was a self-help plate about relationships. Um, I got very lucky that this one has not yet cracked down the center. Uh, I like the idea of a double-headed ax as a, as a metaphor for a complicated relationship. Uh, and I'll leave it at that <laughs> in case my wife watches this later. Uh, Rescue Party and uh, uh, the, the next piece I'll show you are, are sort of sister pieces. Uh, Rescue Party includes this found book with a, with a curious title. I think that leaves all sorts of room for interpretation. Um, but also these a pair of cast bronze uh, with steel ribbon uh, bike handles, the kind you might uh, found again back in the 70s and 80s, maybe now, I'm not entirely sure now, but that kind of freedom of, uh, of bicycles in terms of transportation and independence uh, still coming back into the work. And there's the, the corresponding piece called Lost Patrol. This one includes a tool handle and a wedge of aluminum. Wedge, simple tools, Stone Age tools, all of those things continue to be, you'll see those repeat uh, over and over and over again. This one uh, titled Regalia, uh, again, probably about 40 inches by 40 inches, uh, an old work shirt, shirt of mine turned into a flag, essentially. Um, I think I have a detail of what's going on there with a, an old uh, George Washington bake from a, for, from a foundry not too far from where I live now, and a small cast bronze uh, metal uh, with a combination shield moon uh, symbology that uh, isn't really defined, but again, speaks to that larger sort of patriotism and memorabilia collecting culture. Beautiful warning, yet another napped decorative plate. This one uh, napped from a plate that commemorated the musical Oklahoma, uh, specifically the movie from the 50s that starred, I believe, Shirley Jones. Um, I 
I'll say this, and the, the, the musical, you know, uh, opens with a number uh, called Beautiful Morning. It's, oh, what, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I've got a beautiful feeling. Everything's going my way. And I love that. I love it, especially in contrast to this future that I'm proposing in this archaeological display where we've been reduced to fighting each other with, uh, with spear points napped from decorative plates. So I thought that was a fun sort of dystopian yet maybe maybe still positive future ahead we'll see another plate uh this one commemorating breastfeeding and mothers uh which is a, a curious one that you would find uh as i collected these um the 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 mounting device is sort of inverted in its relationship to the plate which positions the viewer in all sorts of different ways i like spatially how this gets you sort of in a cycle of just spinning about where you are in relationship to this plate, but more specifically relationship to the content of that plate or suggested by that plate. Um, I'm just gonna move a paper around real quick. What is this? Oh, manifestations. Uh, this is a found photograph. It is an eroticized photograph I found in the shop. It is probably from the late 50s, early 60s. What really struck me was, uh, so there's a, a nude figure sort of cradling a, a, um, a cloud of smoke, seemingly, with bits of cotton coming out of it. And uh, to me, it recalled uh, Victorian spirit photography, which I thought was pretty amazing that something like this might have still be might still be produced this much later than that in the Victorian spirit photography early photography all sorts of trickery people were so enthralled with the technology behind photo or photography double exposures and things like that were all the rage still in terms of depicting the spirit world but they would also drape themselves in linen or pull cotton from their mouths and say it was ectoplasm and there are many many photos that are gorgeous uh, from that era and I thought this was a lovely recall to that uh, along, it paired along with this kind of wand, this found stick with barnacles, and uh, I think I've added an old horse tooth to that as well. You'll see that repetition of uh, wedges uh, in there uh, as well. What are the inside boxes made of? The inside boxes are lined with linen. Uh, the outsides are a variety of, of exotic or common woods, uh, everything from sassafras and Peruvian walnut to, uh, you know, oak and, and poplar. Um, all of the framing devices uh, have uh, different colors. No two are the same. I, I mix all those paints by hand for sure to get the exact right color and the exact right sheen I'm looking for. But the insides are just basically wood lined with linen. Uh, and, and inserted into the box and held there mostly by their own tension. Uh, but it allows me to, to kind of, it gives me some, some space to, to play with in there. Does that answer your question? Oh, good. Uh, this one, it looks like a piece of paper, but it's actually a sheet of steel with a, with a neat drawing of, a, again, a Stone Age uh, uh, spear point, uh, juxtaposed with a uh, more typical hardware, variety for sale type sign that you might buy and write something on to direct someone to uh, your yard sale. That's actually one I like. I like that one for some reason. Uh, a couple other pieces. Uh, blind from 2014, a, a, a one-third scale hunting blind. Uh, sort of size to my body. There's a little trap door in the bottom of it. If I stand in it, the, the, the top of the, the hunting blind essentially becomes a mask. So that was a nice little bonus there. On the right is a sculpture called uh, Juiced, which was, I've never won a trophy for anything. This was a trophy I made for myself in 2013, uh, made of wood, paint, cast, and found aluminum. Uh, and it is a sort of homage to the particular energies, violence, and imagination of youth, and especially uh, a kind of boyhood youth, which, um, I think it's a complicated idea, uh, and, and I'm not sure that it's teased out the way it should. Obviously, it's also heavily influenced by personal memory. Boom, boom, box, box uh, is was an attempt to isolate just a moment and a memory uh, of, of sound and space uh, from 2011. It included a fully uh, a functional, formally functional uh, boom box 
where every void had been filled in with an auto body filler and the entire thing painted with like 17 coats of very dense black paint. Uh, part of a Victorian bench uh, that was sort of segmented and left at the edge of this space. Uh, and another little work called Shelter, which is primarily just about parenting. Uh, Ballast was a sculpture I made, uh, quite a large piece, uh, where I was calculating sort of emotional baggage, uh, trying to, I don't remember the exact formula again, but the idea that you could have a weight value for various things that had happened to you throughout your life to the point, and that some of that might be trauma, some of that might be, uh, you know, things that you bring that sort of qualify experience and that you bring into relationships and that you bring into jobs and that you bring into your faith, whatever it is, and how maybe those things, although we tend to frame them negatively, maybe they are this kind of limited resource and that they are some other marker of accomplishment and or of experience. And so I wanted to kind of manifest my, my baggage as ballast or ballast being something that you can use to sort of offset um, in terms of like a, a plane or a submarine, you know, it's a weight balance, but um, I, th I thought of it more of a psychic balance for sure. I mentioned that residency I go to in Norway uh, on the left is a little sculpture I made there one year that I was quite fond of called Woodcutter's Son. Uh, it's one of the few things I've recreated entirely in the studio from scratch uh, when I got home. I would like to do more things like that, um, sort of recreate works that I've made in the past and put a new spin on them. And lastly, uh, I have a sculpture here called Hope, uh, which was a found object sculpture, again, uh, made in Norway and sits in a collection there. It's just silly. And I, somehow it just worked for me and continues to work for me to this day. Um, assuming we have time, I just wanted to run a little bit into ejecta projects. Do we have time there? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, ejecta itself was a show I did. Uh, I was invited to do a solo exhibition at the Flashpoint Gallery in downtown Washington, DC. Sadly, it was a great space and sadly that space is no longer there. I think it got closed down a few years ago. Um, uh, when I had this invitation, uh, it was in 2015 and I was thinking long and hard about where I had come from and where I was going. And part of that conversation I had with my spouse. We met in college at University of North Carolina, and we followed each other throughout graduate school. We had never, uh, she's an art historian and a gallery director now, uh, she was then as well uh, in 2015, but we had never worked or blended our professional and personal lives. And so I asked her to curate this show, and that, that act of curating my work, really the first time I had invited her in a, in a substantial way into my practice, and me invited into her writing process, um, was transformative for us both. We uh, wasn't sure where this show was going to go. She ended up uh, helping to make uh, decisions, not only in individual works of art, but in the overall display. And like I said, I, I found myself contributing to uh, writing in a way that I had not, um, ex in research that I had not done previously. That exhibition uh, was um, so positive, I think, in the end, and I say positive, I think it, it also had a, forced us to investigate notions of success and failure, not only within our relationship, but within parenting and within our professional kind of uh, venues that we were doing, trying to understand where everything connected, that we decided that was so much fun, we want to do this again. We couldn't quite figure out the vehicle. We didn't want it to be just another exhibition. And so in 2018, we, uh, oh, I should say, it, it ended the exhibition. Uh, one of the outcomes was a lovely book project we did together. So um, uh, that, was, that was a fun thing. But um, we ended up starting an art gallery in our hometown. Uh, this was also prompted a little bit by the results of the 2016 presidential election and a feeling that we wanted to maybe contribute something a little bit different and a little bit calmer, uh, more reflective space for critical thinking, um, honestly, uh, within our hometown to make home a, a little bit more like the place we really wanted it to be. So we started this little this little art gallery called Ejecta Projects, borrowing Ejecta from the name of that, that show and that book project. Uh, we just wrapped up our fifth year in February. We have hosted 30 exhibitions and invited over 200 or approximately 200 artists into Carlisle, both local, regional, national, and international artists. So that has been is exceptionally rewarding 
Our very first show was titled Valediction. You can see on the wall there that I'm included in that show, although I'll be honest, I don't include myself in much of anything there. It's so important to bring other voices into the space. I insert myself only when it makes the most sense. Um, I did do one solo show there in our first year to fill out our schedule, but since then we've gained so much momentum that uh, really we have programming for uh, a lot more than what we're able to do right now. Um, our first open call was called Unsolicited Submissions. We've done four or five open calls since then. Um, the part of our mission is we don't charge anyone anything for these uh, submission processes that we are very clear in how we're going to curate from the work that arrives. We use that as a springboard for a good deal of writing, which again, some of that we share online through social media, some of it we squirrel away for ourselves. We're hoping to do a larger reflective writing project on this space at some point in the future. The building itself carries so much of the charm of this gallery. It was, uh, again, it has a sort of Scandi, uh, Scandinavian feel to it. Um, it is uh, half a block from our college campus where I teach uh, and just down the street from our local library. It gets a lot of foot traffic. There's a lovely bar across the street as well. So, I mean, it just, it feels so central in our little town. Um, we also do, I'm not sure I'm getting a little bit of a double image there. We get, um, we do a, a holiday show every so often where we curate um, uh, retail with uh, works of art and where we write about them and connect those things. Sometimes these objects are things you can't find anywhere else, these retail, retail objects. Some of the things we make ourselves and, and some of them are just things that we really respect in terms of the design and that we integrate into our own lives and homes. So it's a chance really to have these deep, deep conversations with everyone that comes in about design and about art. Uh, and that is by far our most popular show. And I apologize for the double image you're seeing there. I must have screwed something up. Uh, most recently, we just closed a show called Cannibals of Love. Uh, again, an open call, 120 applications featuring 23 artists. Um, the show itself, the theme of the show was uh, focused on cinematically scaled notions of love, romance, and humor in art. And we framed it more broadly as kind of what would a rom-com, uh, an, an art rom-com look like, a gallery exhibition rom-com look like. Uh, and sort of got all sorts of things. Uh, it was a very fun show to curate and, um, and assemble. And in, in fact, Melissa was kind enough to participate in that show as well with, with, a, with a piece of hers that we just adore, uh, a video work. Um, in fact, we had so many video applications, we closed down the back of the gallery and we built a theater instead. Uh, so that we could roll sort of we had again like a movie theater like a like a summer blockbuster experience on a smaller scale uh, but that was a lot of a lot of fun and we're, we were sorry to see this show just close last week um, one of the other shows I wanted to talk about again from an open call in 28 or 2021 we did a show called scatter terrain uh, scatter terrain features videos paintings drawings prints photography and sculptures by 25 national and international contemporary artists through a broad understanding of landscape, this exhibition examines themes related both to the isolation incurred during the pandemic and to other fractures and traumas in our surroundings, both environmental and cultural. Um, it was uh, basically a lot of little pockets of landscape or little, little, little um, kind of, we all were using, um, social media, especially throughout the pandemic, to sort of look into other lives and to look into other spaces and to look outside of our house uh, more than we were capable of doing in person sometimes. And we, we, we love that as a, that little pocket universes and those little pocket experiences of, of landscape. And we got, again, a, a broad, a big call, a broad swath of, of applications, and, and we pared it down to just 25 that, that seemed really unique. A few of the other installation shots from that here but really a shameless plug because this show was so lovely um, that we realized in the, the artists in that show were so accommodating, so kind that we thought this is the perfect group show to box up and take on the road. So we were able to, to work with our artists to condense it um, and I repackaged the entire thing and we were able to travel this show and it still is traveling now. It, it's, it was up at uh, Penn State 
uh, for a period. It was down at the University of North Carolina for a period. And here I am installing it at the University of North Carolina. I think I mentioned I went and did my undergraduate there and met my spouse there. Um, this, uh, this, uh, the show itself was too big for the gallery space in the way that we had configured it before. So we did it as a sort of salon style, all on one wall. And again, this gallery in particular was very special to me because it was one of the very first uh, exhibition spaces I had shown in. I'm gonna go past that very quickly um, in that same space. And so I couldn't resist the idea of actually making something new for that space myself, but I didn't want it to compete with the exhibition we were putting up for Ejected Project. So I did a very special installation just for this show that hopefully still kind of resonated with the themes of Scatter Terrain. Um, Basically, I, I made a lot of steel confetti and I spread it along the edges of the space, I, I, sort of a post celebration. And this was at the basically with COVID waning at that point, it seemed appropriate, um, like something good had happened. And someone had come through and cleaned up a lot of confetti, but missed a lot of confetti that was left in the corners. And so you get a sense of some of that there. Uh, again, all painted steel, very subtle, didn't compete. You had to, you didn't notice it until you were really in the space. Um, and I think I have one that shows a little bit more of the process. So each of these ribbons, about 250 ribbons, and then a lot of steel dots, all hand painted, all prepped, and then laid out, held in magnetic trays. I mean, it was, it was a real undertaking. I was so, I was so happy with it though. And again, to be able to be back in that space after so many years and to sort of mark it in my own special way. So it was an exhibition within an exhibition that was also part of the same exhibition. Anyways, that same show is not so far from all of you folks right now. It opens at uh, Up the Road in Baltimore on June 1st at Loyola uh, University, uh, which is just sort of north between Baltimore and Towson University, right? Or Towson, uh, right there. So if you, if you have the impulse this summer to go see some art, uh, I would check out their website and see when they're open uh, and go go up and visit that show. I think there is a closing reception on August 10th. I'll be there for sure if you want to meet in person and chat more about art. But with that, thankfully, right, uh, I am done. I'm happy to take all sorts of questions or any questions. I see something in the chat and I, I should look at that. I have to run. Someone had to leave. That's fine. That's great. Okay. Anthony, that's, that was awesome. Uh, I, I, can I start with a question? Sure. <laughs> Um, um, I, I'm, I'm taken just by the uh, quantity of materials that you can work with, you know, wood and metal and so forth, uh, and it kind of uh, spawned a, a resurgence of the question that I always ask myself is like, why this particular reading, uh, medium for this particular project? Uh, and I was uh, thinking back to in grad school, I was asked that, like, why did you choose oil paint? Why not watercolor? Why not build out a sculpture? Like, how do you deal with, you know, making confetti out of steel and that invitation for a matchbook out of steel when, you know, you're kind of taking this normal material and switching to a different material? Um, what, what, how, you, how do you decide what to use? Um, what, what, kind of, what is the thought process that kind of goes into changing material? Right, right, right. Yeah, no, I mean, and sometimes it is just, it is gut on some level for sure. Other times... You know, again, it comes back, I mentioned the word gestalt earlier, and that, yeah, every material carries a kind of conceptual weight. And so when I think of something like the confetti piece that needed to be subtle, needed to imply softness, but you also want to make sure it carries that tension without that tension within each individual piece, you know, let alone the larger installation, you want that sense of tension so that it draws you in and that you, you're you forced to kind of confront it. I mean... I feel like I trust that material to stand off just enough from the real material to, to suck you in, right? To be like, something's there, I know what it is, now I need to identify it because it's not quite what I thought it was. And, I, and again, it's, it usually is about these very subtle things. I use a lot of found objects, but I also create a lot of objects that look like found objects, right? So it's constantly kind of doing this and again, it's about trying to find that moment of tension, that moment of disconnect, but not so much that you're pushed away, but instead sort of drawn in. And, you know, I, I have affinity for, for all sorts of things, uh, cast plastics and, 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 and certainly steel and wood. Um, 
uh, but I, I love old school. I love plaster. I love stone. I love paper. I love everything. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I really, I, I have no allegiance to any material whatsoever. Do you ever like have an idea that is just so dragging on your brain that, and you, you have this concept of how to accomplish it, but you don't have the skill base to execute it? And do you have to force yourself to actually relearn a new technique by casting or something along those lines mm. uh, to, to facilitate the idea? Does that happen? It does. Yeah, no, it absolutely does. You know, I think where I see it most for, for myself, I mean, with given all the amazing technology around 3D printing or sort of resin printing or the other laser cutting, all these things that are definitely more technology centric. Um, yeah, I have a desire to fall into that space. I find that by the time I start that training process or as I kind of get into it, it's it, that the, the learning curve sometimes it just slows me down too much and I abandon it and I go to something I, I, I feel more confident in right away. But I think, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not certainly not opposed to learning new things and it's never been easier. I mean, I tell students all the time, you know, everything in terms of skill building, it, go to YouTube, let's do it, you know, and just like, if, if I'm not there that day, you're going to find what you need. You just, and thank God the research is out there, the information's out there, go find it for sure. And you'll find not just in some cases better, just different ways of doing things that, you know, I'm always, I'm always looking at makers and how they do things. And I am so, I do not consider myself craft worthy at all. I am so enamored with real craft people and, uh, a real craft culture. I just, yeah, I love, I love making, and I love the people who make uh, as well. Thanks. Hey, uh, guy, that was so impressive. I have so many thoughts, and I wrote so much down, but it's a big jumble now. But speaking of tension, since you brought that up, um, one of the things I love so much about your work is that tension that you. It's almost like this Zen sort of, um, there's like a minimal uh, sensibility about your work that, so you were talking about tension and it seems to me like the, the resolution is like the sense of delight, right? Like you come upon the work, uh, it's, it's a little bit cerebral, right? It is an abstract quality. And I find that when you talk about your work, it just like, there's all these like image, it's like it really fills everything in. Um, but it seems like there's this barrier to entry that it, the reward comes if you take the time to either read the materials or to make the discovery that, oh, this matchbook is made of, of metal. Like, mm -hmm. and then there's delight, which is a kind of, it's a payoff. And so yeah. it seems to me that there's a tension that, you're requiring the viewer to, to make a commitment to actually take the time to to make the discovery uh, and then you'll be rewarded in the end. Could you talk a little bit about, is that, am I accurate? Is that something you think about? Where did it, it come from? It is, it is, you know, and I think again, back to that opening quote, I don't know that my ideas are the most important ideas in the work, right? And so, but this idea that we also want to get people to actually look is the challenge. And then this applies to all of us as, who are makers, right? And exhibitors. We want people to spend some time in front of the work and to maybe not, maybe they're not going to fall into our particular skills because, or the outcomes of our skills or the, 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 the kind of, um, I don't know, splendor, you know, like we, we, I think as artists, we get caught up in our own making maybe a bit too much sometimes, and maybe that's glazed over by a general audience. So you have to set up these other ways that you can draw people in. I think humor is one way for sure. I try to throw that in there. Um, materiality to make sure that materials are accessible so that you can kind of identify things at least from the outcome or from the outset. Um, and then uh, this idea of tapping into a maybe what is a larger kind of communal cultural memory, you know? I mean, these things are always on my mind as I'm designing the work in the initial stages. Um, I don't think I've answered your question though. <laughs> yeah. No, not much, not so much. I think that your answer is in, in, aligned with what I'm noticing, which okay. is there is, um, and it totally makes sense. Your answer completely makes sense. But in order for me, like, I love to look at your work because it's it got a sense of design. It's absolutely beautiful to me because you found a way to combine really um, nostalgic 
objects with a kind of a clean sense, like you've described, like display. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying anything you haven't already said, but um, there is a coolness about that. And yet you've managed to infuse it all with something really, um, sen not sentimental. It's like there's just this mm -hmm. real texture of something deep inside. And, you know, this longing for a, a, a long gone time, like a simpler time. You talk about Stone Age tools. You talk about working with your hands. You talk about your resistance to using like 3D printing, which I totally understand. Um, but yeah, but but yeah, I don't I don't know what I'm saying <laughs> except that um, it, it's like you want us in, but you you there's a there's a coolness which I love that tension that's that tension that you talk about. Um, uh, but I wonder well, what that's about. I think a part of that too is most of the work has some kind of temporal relationship too to to keep that distance there. Um, either in the titling of things, which are most often framed in a kind of past tense. Um, but also and anytime I can kind of infuse something with a with a sense of a disconnect, a temporal disconnect. Um, so that A, you know, there is a little distance from it because again, my memories aren't your memories, but that there's recollection or recognition in that in a, a, some kind of touchstone within that, whatever that composition is that that does kind of keep you there and maybe points you in the right direction. I guess that's the point. I'm looking to get you ballpark. I'm not looking to spoon feed. And I don't know right. that I worry about talking about things so specifically here. And again, I did for a few things, but those aren't, those aren't most people's experiences with those objects. Right. And but you that's you okay. Fall, right. You never fall into like victimhood or too, uh, trite sense sense you know sentimentality but yet as a male artist i i really admire your work for it your ability to like talk about sensible sensitivity and vulnerability um, well that i appreciate for sure because that is by design um and you know again as as a also as a as a father of two daughters i'm, I'm very aware of my maleness and my memories and all sorts of other things, yeah. That that I am critical of as well, as well as celebrate, as well as celebrate. Sorry, Mariana. Yeah, thank you. I, yeah, that's great. I, I agree with everyone in that it's wonderful to see your work, and I can't wait to see it in person. I wanted to ask you a couple of questions with all your skills and your ideas. Uh, one is: to what extent are you able to integrate uh, your students into helping you? Uh, my background is science, and we always kind of interact with our student we used to sure. and helping us do research or helping us complete someone's workup. I'm a physician. So I'm just, and, and I was an academic, academician as well. So I just, one, one question is that. And the other one is, are you a fixer around the house? <laughs> <laughs> You I'll must start be with, wonderful. <laughs> I'll start with the second question first. I uh, I, I am uh, in the process of a move, uh, which we were talking about before the, the talk started. And after living in this house for 16 years, I am appalled at the lack of work I have done to upkeep my house. So I am not a fixer. I try to, I mean, my, my home fixing solutions are absolutely duct tape and Elmer's glue, if I can like it. It's, um, I, I just, um, I don't know. I, I that That's something that does, sort of uh, strike me I, I was I or I was struck during this move in terms of in terms of collaboration or you know I kind of have adopted you know uh, my studio is at my the institution where I teach and so the students are often around me and they I'll say this I learned early on not to shut my door and if I shut my door it's endless knocks if I leave my door open <laughs> they see me working they respect that and they go to their studios and they work as well so I integrate my teaching and my pedagogy are all part of my studio practice literally because I'm in the same space but also simply as a mechanism for survival everything is integrated into my studio practice this is sort of one of the lessons of the whole objective show that we teased out together was that um, you don't check your faith, you don't check your identity at the door when you go into your studio. And so I, uh, I kind of have a one, one hat philosophy. I wear many hats, people say that, uh, you know, uh, I, I've consolidated it into one hat. Everything is studio practice, marriage, parenthood, teaching, 
gallery work, travel. Yeah, it needs to it needs to all be one uh, for me to make it work. And I draw from all those things. And by the same count, every time I'm making some uh, kind of uh, meal uh, at home, I see that as an extension of studio process too. And maybe even more literally, I, I did a lot of time in food service uh, in college, and I still recommend food service and kitchen work to students in the summers over. Uh, an internship because so many of those processes of maintaining a kitchen are identical to what you do in a sculpture studio. So, yeah. That's wonderful. I can't imagine how thrilled the students must be to be able to work with you on some little aspect of, some, of what you do. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. I appreciate the question and the time here. Are there any other questions or I had one last question if we have time. How did working with Shannon affect your work or the way you think about your work? Um, you know, so again, as a, as a trained art historian, you know, I, 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 my own art historical training and background from, from college and graduate school was, was maybe insufficient. And so, um, our shared library, I think, has been the greatest point of connection. All the art books and art historical books that um, that that we kind of share, but also, you know, those conversations that were once sort of so separated are are basically our dinner time conversations now. I mean, it, it involves not just Shannon and I talking about art broadly or our own art practices or our own professional practices, but you know, the kids are part of that that too. And just again, this idea that everything becomes a sounding board. Um, I'm far less vulnerable or worried about, about her judging my work since she's been a larger part of it. Um, and, and, you know, not that she needs to be a part of it all the time, and I don't expect that, but it, 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 it does give me a kind of confidence for sure to, to know that she can come in look at things very quickly, get exactly to the, the core of what my issue might be or where I'm still having a hang up on a specific work of art. And I do bring her in more frequently mid process than at the end uh, at this point, just to get that input. So yeah, it's just, it's fantastic to have that trust. Yeah. And she's a smart cookie. She's pretty smart. Yeah. Anthony, thank you so much. That was an awesome presentation. I was really excited to hear that. I mean, I saw the images ahead of time, but I think when you explained the the work as we kind of go through it was uh, a, quite a treat. And I have a new appreciation for a lot of those pieces because I just didn't know what they were actually made of. Um, no, no, I and I, I cannot thank you all enough for the invitation. And what you guys are doing with this program is amazing. And uh, I hope to continue direct, to direct uh, folks to it and to see it grow and to uh, maybe come back at some point. In the yeah, future. please, always. Yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so Thank much. you, Melissa. Thank you. Thank you for agreeing to do this. Have a great weekend. Don't forget June 1st. Uh, look, uh, what was the name of the college? It, is it um, Loyola? Your, Loyola. Is it Loyola? Yeah. Okay, I yeah. wasn't sure if it was Loyola. Okay. Wonderful. And also, and also in two weeks, Melissa is back uh, with David Page. So she's kind of on a, on a, a hosting pair. I love David Page. Oh, I he's, hope you can join he's us. He's amazing. Join yes. Us. Join us. Yeah, he's amazing. And then following that, we have Erwin Timbers from the Washington Glass School talking about uh, recycled glass. So he's pretty awesome. Fantastic. Thanks a lot with a beer. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. Thank you all for attending. And thank you, Melissa and Anthony. Thank Wonderful. You guys, and thank much. you. Bye. Bye. Have a great weekend. You too. Thank bye -bye. you.